questions, comments, please put it on chat box and we'll try to answer most of them. If today time permits all today, if time does not permit, then we'll answer it on email later on. Over to Amit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Is my slide visible, sir? Yes, I can see that. Okay, so, so thank you, Dr. Ajay and Dr. Mahesh Goenka, sir, for the kind words. I think both of you are here and thank you for being in this session. So the topic of my presentation is image enhanced endoscopy, the techniques and clinical applications. So I'm just going to give you an overview of the technologies and what are the important clinical applications. So when we say image enhancements, what do we mean by image enhanced endoscopy? So if you look at this image of dodenum with a white light, you see the mucosal fold, and you also see this surface which appears flat. You know? But when you apply image enhancement to this area, then you can actually see this individual villi, and you can actually see even the blood cells. So by applying image enhancement, you are able to see the surface in much more detail than you do with a white light examination. And this gives you an opportunity to pick up lesions in real time, even before you have taken biopsies to target areas which look abnormal. So this is enhanced endoscopy where we enhance the image and get much more detailed information about the mucosal surface. So now the three principles of Enhancing image are that you magnify the image, you add some resolution to the image, okay, and you add contrast. So three basic principles: you add magnification, you add resolution, and you add contrast. And by these three methods, you are able to enhance the image you see. And there are multiple image enhanced technologies available. Sometimes the names may be quite confusing, but if you can remember them in the groups I have shown in this slide, it will be easier to understand. So based on the amount of magnification you give and also the method, the contrast is applied, there are different technologies, okay? The oldest form of image enhancement is the dye spray chromoendoscopy, which was the earliest form where you used to spray dye on the mucosa, like methylene blue or your carmine, alugol cyanide, etc. And by spraying the dye on the surface, you could get a better appreciation of the surface characteristics, okay? So this was called a dye spray chromoendoscopy, the earliest form of enhancement. Then came this group of modalities called digital chromoendoscopy. Now, in digital chromoendoscopy, the name itself is digital. So you just manipulate the wavelength of light digitally instead of spraying any dye or any contrast on the surface. So by manipulating the wavelength of light digitally, you get images similar to chromoendoscopy. And there are multiple technologies in this group, including the narrowband imaging, loop imaging, eye scan, optical enhancement, etc. Now, the benefit of digital chroma endoscopy is that one is that you don't pay a tie. Second thing is these technologies generally come together with higher magnified images and better resolution. And with digital chroma endoscopy, also assess the vascular pattern, which is something which doesn't get enhanced with a dye spray chroma endoscopy. So because of these advantages, you know, you don't have to spray a dye, you're getting a magnified image, you're looking at the vascular pattern in addition to surface pattern. Digital chroma endoscopy is now one of the most common methods of image enhancement in, used in clinical practice. And among them, most of the work has been done in narrowband imaging, and that's what my topic will be focusing on, okay? And then we have the group of modality where the magnification is even higher, you have 10 to the power 3 magnification. So with this, you are actually able to look at the individual cells and even the structures inside cell like nucleus and all. So in real time with such high magnification, you can look at the cellular structure, the subcellular structure and examples of these technologies include confocal laser endomicroscopy and endocytoscope. Okay. So again, three groups depending on the amount of magnification and the way contrast is applied, we had the convention older one or the dye spray chroma endoscopy. Then you have this group of technologies called digital chroma endoscopy, including NBI, BI, and I scan. And you have the microscopy techniques, which shows 
the details up to cellular or subcell level like confocal laser endomicroscopy and endocytoscopy. So first I'll discuss a little bit about the digital chroma endoscopy, then two to three slides on the microscopy techniques. So now as I say narrowband imaging is the most popular form of digital chroma endoscopy and a lot of literature is available on this. So what is narrowband imaging? Why is it called narrowband imaging? So when you do a normal white light examination, you are using the entire visible spectrum. You have the red, you have the green and the blue. So that's what you do when you do a white light imaging, normal endoscopy. But in narrowband imaging, a part of the green and part of the blue wavelength is used. So you only are using only a narrow wavelength of light, not the entire visible spectrum. And because only a narrow portion of green and narrow portion of blue is used, this is called narrowband imaging. Now, this technology was developed by Olympus and it has been in commercial use for more than 15 years. So when we look at the principle of this imaging, it is almost similar to a white light endoscopy. The endoscope also looks like a white light endoscope. The main difference is this NBI filter. So, this, so when you press the narrowband imaging button on the endoscope, the NBI filter comes on the pathway of the white light. And then this filters out the light and you get only a small wavelength of blue in the 415 nanometer range and a small wavelength of green in the 540 nanometer range. These are the lines of light and these lights illuminate the mucosal surface and then you get the image. So by doing this, you are adding contrast to the image. And as I told you, these, this, these technologies also come with high definition television so you have more resolution and the images are magnified. So the final image which you look on your screen has the basically it is it is a combination of a narrow band which gives contrast, a high definition television which gives you more resolution and magnification. Okay. So by all this, the image is enhanced and you see much more detail than you see on a white light examination. So this just shows you a snapshot of how different part of GI tract appear on narrow band imaging. So as you can see. Now, I'm sure most of you would have seen and done gastroscopy and colonoscopy. And just think about the images you see during your gastroscopy, colonoscopy, and look at the images I'm showing you in this slide. Okay, This is how an esophagus appears with this IPCL pattern here. This is the gastroesophageal junction with the esophagus and the stomach mucosa. This is the body of stomach. This is the antrum of stomach, the duodenum with the villi, and the colon. So what you're seeing, you're looking at this vascular pattern, the vessels, you're looking at the surface, you can look in the crypt opening, etc. So you're looking at the microvascular pattern and you look at the microsurface pattern. You're looking at the mucosa in much more detail. Okay? And therefore, if there is some changes in these appearances, then that will suggest an early lesion. And that can be picked up even before you see changes on a white light examination. So one of the key strengths of image enhanced endoscopy is that you detect lesions at an earlier stage. But as I said, to do that, you have to first know what is the normal appearance of different part of GI tract. A little bit, and then once you appreciate how different part of GI tract appears on this imaging, then you'll be able to pick up abnormalities as well. Okay. So I'll just show a quick video about how to do a image enhanced endoscopy. Now the first endoscopy, whether it is a normal white light endoscopy or image enhancement is that you have to clean the mucosal surface of any debris. Like you see, there's so much of mucosal debris here. So you apply water jet or flush and you clean the mucosal surface of any debris. Okay, that's the first step, any endoscopy. The next step is after you have done the cleaning of the mucosal surface, then you always begin with a white light examination. Just because you have uh, image enhanced technology doesn't mean you have to first start with this thing. You first do a white light examination, something which you are familiar with. You look for any subtle abnormalities like any lesion, nodule, ulcer, polyp, etc. And then you can do a narrowband imaging as a next step. So first I showed you we need to clean the surface of mucus and debris. Then you do a good white light examination. And then we switch to the narrowband imaging mode. So this is the NBI mode as you can see. Okay. And then we can go to the near focus mode where we see more details of structure. Okay. And then we have frozen. So this is again a very important part of examination. Because the images are magnified, you are seeing a lot of details during examination. It's very important to learn how to freeze the image at the right time. So that once you have frozen, because in real time, 
with so much of magnification, even a little bit movement will not let you interpret the findings easily. But once the image is frozen, then you have all the time to appreciate how different areas are appearing. So again, begin with washing the mucosal surface, clean the mucosa, do a white light examination, and then you go to a narrow band or whichever modality you're using, scan or blue laser imaging, whatever. And once you're doing the image enhanced endoscopy, you should learn how to freeze the image so that you can examine them properly without any movement. So that, and this, so this holds true, as I said, for any technology, NDI, BLI, whatever. Okay. Now, that was mainly about narrowband imaging, the technology which has been in use for 15 years and a lot of literature exists. But as I told you, there are other technologies as well. And these technologies also, the principle is almost similar to narrowband image. For example, you have this blue laser imaging or the BLI. Now, this is from Fujinon. In difference here is that instead of a xenon lamp, which produces a light, they are using laser for the light. So that's why it's called blue laser imaging. The laser serves as a source of light. But here again, if you look, they are using this two narrow wavelength of light to obtain the images. This is what we even do for an NBI. And therefore, it's not surprising that the appearance of the images on blue laser imaging is similar to narrowband. So if you are familiar with one technology, you can easily use another technology. The surface and the vascular characteristics will be quite similar. But obviously, because different companies are making, they have to do some tweaking to get over the copyright and patent issues. Okay. Similarly, there's another technology from Pentax, which is called the eye scan optical enhancement. More closer to NBI, because here again, they have a filter like we have in narrowband imaging. And the filter filters light in the blue and the green. So it's exactly almost similar to a narrowband imaging. So again, so what is the benefit of this digital chroma endoscopy? We had the dye spray chroma endoscopy. Why to invest money, buy these sort of endoscopes which are more expensive? So as I told you, the one major benefit is that with the dye spray, you're only looking at the surface characteristics. But with digital chroma endoscopy, you're also looking at the vascular pattern. So this gives you more information than a white light image. And the second thing is you don't spray any contrast. And like in a contrast, in a dye spray, once you spray it, then the mucosa gets stained, then you can't take it off. It will take some time for it to clear. But in digital chroma endoscopy, you can switch between the contrast mode or the normal mode as many times as you feel like. So you can switch between the two modes and you can also get a better characterization of vascular pattern. The images are more magnified. So you're seeing much more details. And that's the reason why these technologies are more popular currently than the dye spray chroma endoscopy. Okay. So coming back to the initial slides, as I said, we have different groups of image enhancement, the dye spray, the digital chroma endoscopy. So now I have just discussed about the digital chroma endoscopy, including the narrowband imaging, the blue light imaging, laser imaging, and eye scan. Okay. And then we have the more recent ones where the images are much more magnified. As I told you, you can look at the cellular and even the substructures like confocal laser endomicroscopy and endocytoscopy. So of which Confocal is endomicroscopy. It's like basically you are doing a real-time scanning of the mucosal layer. So you can actually see the mucosa real-time without having to take a biopsy. You can look at the epithelium. You can look at the real-time. Okay? This is like obtaining a virtual biopsy. Okay. So the one techno the technology which is currently used is called, although it's not used widely because of the expense and the, obviously it takes more knowledge for interpretation of images. But the one which is now currently available is the probe-based, called the PCLE, the probe-based confocal laser endomicroscopy. This is a probe which passes through the channel of your endoscope. So this probe then, when it touches the mucosal surface, you get images like this, which is almost like a histopathology image. So in real time, you can say this is a normal area or this is a cancerous area. However, the problem with these technologies, one is it's very expensive. Second thing is, how to interpret because, because you, know, you are looking at a small area with so much of magnification. How to do a complete examination, say, of a stomach or esophagus? How do you interpret so much of information which is coming on the monitor, actually? So these are right now the limitations. Obviously, with the, with the development of artificial intelligence, these may improve. So currently, this technology is not it's used widely mainly because of these limitations. But again, this has the potential to show you much more details than even a than a digital chroma endoscopy. The other form of microscopy is, is called endocytoscopy. This is again from Olympus. Okay. Now, endocytoscopy is like doing microscopic examination of your mucosal cells. 
So during microscopy, what do we do? We take a slide, okay? We stain the slide, and then we get the microscope lens, close the slide. So here also, this is the mucosal surface. You stain the mucosal surface. After you have stained the mucosal surface, you bring the endoscope close to the surface. So it's like microscopy of the mucosal surface in real time. And the images you get are like this, which is almost like a microscopic image you see in the slide, h in slides actually, okay? So again, here the potential is, is quite huge because you are seeing images at such high magnification, more than 500 times of magnification. They can, you can detect lesions in real time even before taking a biopsy, okay? Now the one uh, drawback of this technology compared to the confocal laser is that in confocal I showed you, you can see the epithelium and the lamina propria, a bit deeper structures can also be seen. But in endocytoscopy, you are mainly looking at the upper layer only. You are not looking at the deeper layers, actually. Okay. So, now, again, the problem with this technology is that the image is very, very magnified, more than 500 times. So, when you are touch, when you are close to the mucosal surface, you have to keep your endoscope absolutely stable to get a stable image. If of the endoscope will take your image out of focus. Now, we had this endoscope at our center for a few weeks for demonstration purpose. And while the image qualities were very good, what we found difficult was to keep the image under focus. Okay. So what I've been discussing so far is that there are different methods of image enhancement. You had the older technique, uh, spray chroma endoscopy, which is still used in some settings. Then we have the digital chroma endoscopy, like narrowband imaging, blue laser imaging, and eye scan, which are the ones used right now in clinical practice. And then you have the more magnified uh, image enhancement, like the probe-based confocal laser endomicroscopy and cytoscopy. Now, the issues with these sort of image enhancement is that the amount of information you're looking at is quite big. You have to be familiar with what is a normal pattern, what is an abnormal pattern. And all this may not be very easy for a human mind to do it, actually, okay? And this is where artificial intelligence is going to be a big help. And there are already a lot of work being done and it's shown that artificial intelligence can help us in interpreting the findings during this image enhanced endoscopy. In fact, companies have already now come out with the artificial intelligence enabled devices like you have this endo aid from Olympus, which helps to detect adenomas during image enhancement in real time. You have this CAD eye from Fujinon, which again helps you detect adenoma during real time endoscopy. And Olympus has also come out with something called an endo brain, which is for endocytoscopy to help us interpret. So I think in future, Artificial intelligence will come integrated with image enhancement so that the application is much more easier and you are able to help interpret findings more easier than otherwise for a human mind and human eye to see and appreciate everything, sometimes it's a bit challenging. Okay. So that was the first part of my presentation where I discussed about the different image enhanced technology. Now for the second part of my presentation, I'm going to talk on the clinical applications. Okay. Now, what are the clinical applications of the technology? So, as I told you, I'm currently among the enhanced imaging, the digital chroma endoscopy is the one which is commonly used. And among them, narrowband imaging is the one where a lot of work has been done. This is something which I have been using in my practice for more than 12 years now. Okay. So, I'll show you some clinical applications of this technology. Let's start with a case-based scenario. Let's say, and we start with an esophag case from the esophagus. So you have a 60-year-old male patient who's known case of Barrett's esophagus. Okay. Now we know when somebody has Barrett's, we need to keep them on surveillance three to five years. This patient is scheduled for surveillance. So what is the recommendation for surveillance? That when you do a surveillance, you do endoscopy and you take four quadrant biopsy every two centimeters. That is the Seattle protocol. Now this four quadrant biopsy is a random biopsy. And when you do random biopsy, you may only sample a small surface and it may miss areas with dysplasia. Now to my point more clearer, these are two images of our patients with Barrett's. Look at this image. This is the Barrett's esophagus. So if you are doing a surveillance in this patient, you may take image from, say, if you're doing a four quadrant biopsy, you may take a biopsy from here, you may take a biopsy from here, biopsy from this area, this area. But what if the dysplasia lies in this region? So just by taking random biopsy, you are not sure that the area where you are biopsying, dysplasia will be in that area. So there is a chance of missing 
place. Look at this case. This is a long segment Barrett's. Okay. Now here again, if you're doing a four quadrant biopsy two centimeter, you will probably take from here this area, this area, and this area. But what if the dysplasia is in this area? So is there any technique by which we can, during endoscopy itself, say that okay, this area to me looks dysplastic. Okay, and I should be taking so. Can we identify dysplasia in real time? The answer to this question is yes. Image enhanced endoscopy can help us in detecting dysplasia in real time. And so again, I said I will be discussing mainly about narrowband imaging. In terms of Barrett's esophagus, there are different patterns which have been described. So and I said you have to be familiar with these patterns to use them in your practice. So you may have this round pattern or you can have the ridge pattern. There are the cerebriform pattern, the villus pattern. There are multiple patterns described in Barrett's esophagus. But how do you detect dysplasia? So there is a very simple classification proposed by Dr. Pratik Sharma and group from US. They said that when you're doing a narrowband imaging in Barrett's, you look at the mucosal or the surface pattern and whether it is circular or ridge or whatever, as long as the pattern is regular, the chance of dysplasia is minimum. There's very little chance of dysplasia. Once you see irregularity, then you suspect dysplasia. And as I said, with image enhancement from surface pattern, we also see vascular pattern. So with this, we can also assess the vascularity. And for vascularity, also same thing. If there is any irregularity of vascularity, then you can suspect dysplasia. So when you're doing a surveillance, if the surface looks irregular or the vascular, so both of them don't. If one of them is irregular, it is sufficient to say that that area probably has dysplasia with 85% accuracy, you can predict that there is dysplasia and you are going to take targeted biopsy from that area. So this is called the Bing classification or the Barrett's International NBI Group classification for dysplasia. Okay. And there are multiple studies which have clearly shown that narrowband imaging detects more patients with dysplasia. It needs fewer biopsy sample. In fact, a meta-analysis has shown that the sensitivity and specificity of identifying dysplasia is more than 90%. Okay, so we have a technology which can help us in real time detect dysplasia. Now let's come back to the two images I showed you earlier. This was the first image I showed you. So I told you this is a patient with Barrett's plan for surveillance. Randomly, we may take biopsy from different areas, but we may not. We won't know which area has dysplasia. So when you do a narrowband imaging of this, this is for the appearances. So one thing you can appreciate that it looks same everywhere. So it is regular. So in this patient, there is no dysplasia based on NBI. And you can take biopsy from any four areas. So please remember, this doesn't mean that you should not take biopsy. Still, the recommendations are that you should still take biopsy even if you don't find dysplasia because there may still be some misrate with even image enhancement. This particular case, with image enhancement, we see everything is looking regular. So we can biopsy from anywhere we feel like. Okay. Now, this is the second image which I had shown you, the long segment Barrett's. Now, in this patient, when we did narrowband imaging, you can straight away appreciate that this area, the vascular pattern is irregular. Other areas. Okay. So, in this case, if we do narrowband imaging, we can straight away identify that this area is looking abnormal to me and I'm going to take a biopsy from this area. Whereas, if you didn't have this technology, if you just said, probably could have biopsy from here, this area, this area, this area, and you could have missed this place, which is called this place. Yeah. So this is one of the key applications currently for image enhancement and any patient who has got Barrett's and when he's planned for surveillance, we are using narrowband imaging to detect dysplasia. Although the rate of dysplasia is quite low in our population, but still for an individual patient, it does make a difference when you can pick up dysplasia because that means you can offer him early therapy before a cancer can develop. So that was about the first application in esophagus, which is for detecting dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. Okay. Now we go to the second case scenario. Let's say you are seeing a 55-year-old male patient who's come to you with dyspeptic symptoms. Okay? Now, this patient is only dyspepsia. He doesn't have any alarm symptoms. And when you take further history, you find out that his brother had gastric cancer at the age of 43 years. So, there's a first-degree relative early onset. There was a 43-year, he had gastric cancer. Okay? This patient had already had a previous endoscopy three years ago. And that time, he was found to have extended dyspepsia. And he also received H. pylori eradication therapy in the past. So, obviously, if somebody is 55 years old and dyspepsia, you know, they will ask. But 
This patient has a family history cancer. He has extensive intestinal metaplasia and has a past history of H. pylori infection. So all these features put him at a high risk of developing gastric cancer. Now the problem with gastric cancer is that by the time symptoms develop, the cancer is usually advanced. And many of them are not operable actually. So if you wait for symptoms to develop, then it may be too late. So can we put patient on some sort of a surveillance program? Can we, when we do an endoscopy, can we apply some technology by which we can pick up an early gastric cancer, which is not even seen on a white light examination? Because if we can pick up an early gastric cancer, then that will make a big difference to this patient's long-term outcome. So here again, the answer is yes. With image-enhanced technology, we can pick up early gastric cancer before they are visible on a white light examination. Now, currently, the challenge is which patient to use them for. The example I showed you is a very good patient to use this technology because he has multiple risk factors like family history of gastric cancer, previous history of metaplasia, pylori infection. So somebody like this, if, it is, if the patient is seen in your clinic, and if you have image-enhanced technology available, this patient is one you would subject to image enhancement. Earlier that when you want to apply a technology, you need to know what the normal pattern is before you can detect what is abnormal. Okay. So this is the NBI or narrowband imaging appearance of gastric mucosa. And this will be similar if you do a blue laser imaging or eye scan, the appearance will be almost same because the technologies are very much similar. They're all using narrow wavelength of light. Okay. Now in stomach, in body, you see this dot-like structure, which are the opening of the crypt. The white structure is the epithelium lining the crypt. And you have this brown string to the blood vessels in a honeycomb pattern. Okay. So you have the round the pit opening, the epithelium, which is white in color, and you have the vessels which are in honeycomb pattern. And you have this darker appearing, longer vessels with branches, which are called the collecting venue. So this is how a typical body and fundus of stomach appears. In the antrum, the appearance is different. The white structures, instead of being round, as you saw here, they are elongated, they are tubular in a zigzag fashion. This is called reticulate pit pattern. The vessels which were in honeycomb pattern, the brown structure honeycomb pattern here, now they are more like coil shaped. Okay? They are like coils. The brown structures are in coil shaped. Okay? And the collecting venules which you saw here, you don't see it in the antrum. So this is a normal pattern of a body of stomach and the antrum of stomach. Now how do you detect early gastric cancer in the stomach? For this, the classification which is most widely used the VS classification, the V stands for vessel and S stands for surface. But to apply this classification, first you have to look for what is called as a demarcation line. What is demarcation line? Demarcation line is basically it's an imaginary line which denotes an abrupt change in pattern. So if you look at this picture, the pattern here is so different from this area. So there is an abrupt change of pattern and this is a demarcation line which demarcates this lesion from the rest of the mucosa. Here again, there is an abrupt change of pattern between this and this area, and you can see a demarcated area here. The first step is to identify a demarcation line. Now, once you have seen a demarcation line, then within the demarcated area, you assess the V, which is the vascular pattern, and S, which is the surface pattern. Now, in this example, the vascular pattern is quite irregular. So this straight away suggests gastric cancer. Here, the surface pattern is quite irregular. This also suggests a gastric cancer. So what I mean to say is that you don't have to have both abnormal. If both are there, then the chance is very high. But even if you have only abnormal, this still predicts gastric cancer with a high accuracy. Okay. So the algorithm to do this is called the MESTA-G, which stands for Magnifying Endoscopy Simple Diagnostic Algorithm for Early Gastric Cancer. So again, you begin with a good white light examination. Look for any suspicious lesion. If nothing, then you can switch to a narrowband imaging. And again, look for any suspicious lesion. Once you find a suspicious lesion, then you first look for a demarcation line. Nice. Between the normal and abnormal area. If demarcation line is not seen, then it is unlikely to be gastric cancer. If demarcation line is seen, as you see in this picture, then in the demarcated area, you look for irregularity in the vessel pattern or irregularity in the surface pattern. One of them is sufficient if both of them don't have to be regular. If one is there, both are there, it's good enough. But if you have one, that's sufficient to diagnose gastric cancer. Okay. So this is how we apply image enhancement to pick up gastric cancer. I'll show you a couple of examples. So this is the first example. This is a white light image of stomach. 
Now, if you are not very careful in examination, you may pass it off as a normal examination. But if you look carefully, there is a pale area in this part of stomach. Okay, and when you apply image enhancement or narrow band imaging in this, straight away you can appreciate there's a demarcation line here between this area and this area. So that's the first criteria satisfied. And within the demarcated area, you see a lot of irregular blood vessels. So this is an example of gastric cancer, which is picked up so much easier on an image enhanced endoscopy. So another example of a case, this is the endoscopic image of antrum. Again, if you are not very careful, then you are going to just pass it off as a normal examination. But if you look closely, there is some abnormality here. And when you switch to narrowband imaging mode, you can see there's a demarcation line between this normal area and abnormal area. And in the demarcated area, you are seeing this irregular vessels. This is again suggestive of gastric cancer. And here again, there are multiple studies which have shown that image enhanced endoscopy has got much better specificity. So diagnostic efficacy is much better than white light in picking up early gastric cancer. Okay. So scenario where we had a, so, so the patient I showed you, if you have technology available, then for that patient, you are going to use image enhanced endoscopy at early stage. The third case scenario basically from colon. This again is a frequently encountered scenario. So you're doing a colonoscopy in a 55-year-old male patient, and then you find that there's a three centimeter sessile lesion in the rectum. This is a sessile polypoid lesion. Now we know polypoid lesions can be removed endoscopically by EMR or which is endoscopic mucosal dissection, or EST, which is endoscopic submucosal dissection. But this is true if the patient has a adenoma, maybe superficial cancer. If there is a deep invasive cancer, then that patient should be referred for surgery. So obviously, if you want to confirm, you need to have a pathological diagnosis. But is it possible in real time, looking at the lesion, to say that this lesion looks like just a dysplasia or a superficial cancer, or this patient looks deep invasive, okay? Because if you can make the decision real time, then if somebody needs endoscopic therapy, you can finish it in the same session. Okay, otherwise you have to prepare the colon after biopsy and call the patient back again. Okay. So here again, I'll show you a couple of images. These are two polypoid lesions in colon. Look at this. This is a white light image of the first lesion. This is a white light image of the second lesion. I'll come back to it again in, later in my presentation. So in colon, like for stomach, I showed you about the different pattern which you see in the stomach. In colon, again, we have a different pattern. And in colon, the important thing to look for is the pit pattern, which is called the Kudos pit pattern. Now, this actually was developed even before NBI or any image enhancement came, before NBI came into existence. This was mainly for magnifying endoscopy and dice chromoscopy. So basically, with Kudos pit pattern, you're looking at the pits on the surface of polyp. And based on the morphology of the pits, you can predict whether it is a hyperplastic polyp, whether it's adenoma, Polyp or whether it's a carcinoma. So if the pits are round or stellate, then it is hypoplastic or non-neoplastic. If the pits are elongated, like you can see in this example, tubular, or if they have branching, like here, or if they're small tubular, then it is likely to be adenomatous polyp. If there are non-structural pits, pits are absent, some are looking bizarre, then you suspect an invasive carcinoma. So in colonic polyp, even a pit pattern alone is sufficient to tell you about the underlying lesion. However, with the availability of narrowband imaging, a classification was developed, which is called the NICE classification or the NBI, International Colorectal Endoscopy Classification. So for Barrett's, we had the Bing classification. For stomach, we had the VS classification. For colonic polyps, we had the NICE classification. Now, this, as I told you, because in narrowband imaging or image enhancement, we are also able to appreciate the vascular pattern. the surface pattern described by the kudos pit pattern they have also added the vascular pattern to improve the accuracy of detection and they've also added the color of lesion so you when you do a, a nbi for a colonic lesion you look at the color you look at the vascular pattern you look at the surface pattern and based on the features on these pattern you have the type 1 which is hypoplastic type 2 which is adenomatous and type 3 which is invasive cancer so again, I won't go into details because of lack of time. But in type 2, if you see the pits, as I told you, kudos pit pattern, you can see this tubular and branched pits, which is as kudos 3 and 4. The blood vessels are dark brown, but blood vessels are seen 
everywhere. In type one, the pits may be round, and the vessels are very faint. They are not seen very easily. They may be very faint actually. Okay. So in type one, the is same height as background. The vessels are quite faint, and the surface is like dots, like you saw in the kudos type one and two. Whereas in the type two, you have this tubular or the branched, like you can see in this area. But you can also see the vascular pattern, the brown vessels, which are the dark brown, which you don't see much in the type one, and they are seen everywhere. Whereas in type three, there are areas where the vascular pattern is disrupted or missing, and there are areas where the surface pattern is disrupted or missing. So look at look at this picture, this whole area. There you can hardly any vascular pattern, hardly see any surface pattern. As you can see, some brown vessels in here. So type three is an invasive cancer. The patient has to be referred for surgery. Type two is adenoma or maybe a superficial cancer. This patient can be managed with endoscopic therapy. Okay. And again, there are again multiple studies uh, with NBI for colorectal polyps, and they have shown that NBI is very good in discriminating neoplastic from non-neoplastic polyps. Now coming back to the example I showed you in the beginning of the colon section. This was the white light image of uh, cystic lesion I showed you. Now when you do a narrow band imaging, what type of Polyp this fits into by the nice classifications. As I told you, in type two polyp, the tubules or the pit patterns are tubular or branched. So you can see this elongated white structures. You can see branching in some area. Okay, and the vessels are dark brown. So here again, vessels are brown, and the vessels are seen everywhere. So same like the image I showed you. You can see this picture: the white tubular structures, the dark dark brown vessels, and the There's no areas of missing vessel or missing surface. So this is an example of type two lesion. So this patient, if I did NBI, okay, this patient I can straight away go for a EMR or EST. Now this is the second image I showed you. Now in this image, this is the white light appearance. But when you do narrow band image, you can straight away appreciate that these areas, the vascular pattern is gone missing, the surface pattern is gone missing. Whereas in some areas you can see some brown vessels. So this is an example of type three or a deep invasive cancer. And this sort of polyp should be sent for, if it is a site, should be sent for surgical resection. Now, one word of caution in colonic polyps, you know, like in uh, nice classification, I told you about this type one, which is hyperplastic. Now, some people think it's hyperplastic polyp; it can be left alone. But please remember that there is another group of polyp called sessile serrated adenoma, where the awareness is slow, is increasing slowly, and this polyp has a malignant. Potential unlike a hyperplastic polyp, but this polyp appears like a type one or hyperplastic polyp, and therefore during colonoscopy, even if polyp, it may still be a sessile serrated adenoma, and therefore you have to remove it. If it is in rectum, sometimes you can leave it alone. Apart from rectum, anywhere in the colon, if you see a polyp which looks like type one, it may be hyperplastic, but it may also be a sessile serrated adenoma, and therefore those polyps have to be removed. now there are there is ongoing work on how to differentiate a truly hyperplastic from cell serrated adenoma looking at the surface etc but this is a work in progress so now for practical purpose if you see a polyp in any part of colon except maybe rectum because in rectum hyperplastic polyps are okay the ssas are not very common but apart from rectum anywhere else if you see any polyp you have to at least do a biopsy or remove the polyp we can't leave it alone because that polyp may be a cell serrated adenoma the main technology right now is that if you have a lesion which is you know which may be which is is it cancerous or is it uh, adenomatous so you can make a differentiation and you can decide on your therapy actually okay so those were the main applications of this technology as i told you to detect dysplasia in barrett's esophagus pick up early gastric cancer if you have a colorectal lesion is it a carcinoma is it an adenoma to decide on your therapeutic approach or there are other applications as well which we are not going to go into detail due to lack of time this includes detection of early esophageal squamous cell carcinoma you know ibd there is a recommendation patients who are having a pancreatitis after 8 to 10 years they need to have a surveillance the current recommendation for surveillance is that you do a dye spray chromo endoscopy however there are at least two to three randomized studies which have shown that narrow band image as good as a dye spray chromo endoscopy and you don't have to spray dye so here again now some of our patients we have started using and narrow band imaging for surveillance although more data is required to firmly establish its role but as of now it looks to be as good as a dye spray chromo endoscopy 
another area is for surveillance of colonic polyp again not done routinely in our country but in places where surveillance is involved earlier data was disappointing but more recently looks like in more polyp on surveillance another thing another condition which is common in a tropical country like india is a malabsorption in some malabsorptic conditions you may have villus atrophy okay. now with image enhancement you can actually look at the atrophy villus in real time okay and then you can take targeted biopsies if some areas are atrophic some are normal you can take a targeted biopsy and finally in patients who have lesion where we are doing an emr or est we want to ensure that the entire lesion is removed in those per situation image enhancement can help us in making sure that the entire lesion is resected with adequate margin so this is an example of esophageal cancer on nbi you can see this area with different color the vessels are very irregular this is an example of esophageal carcinoma this is an example of villus atrophy so this is the duodenal mucosa with normal villi this is a patient with villus atrophy you cannot see any of this finger like projections in this image which you see here now when the atrophy is diffused then this technology is not very helpful but we know that in some cases of celiac disease the atrophy may be patchy so if you can real time see which area is atrophic area big then you can take a targeted biopsy but please remember nbi or image enhancement is not a substitute for biopsy duodenal biopsy is still required in all cases of malabsorption because there are many conditions which do not necessarily produce villus atrophy so this only is an aid in targeting atrophic areas for biopsy but it is not a substitute for biopsy and histopathology then i was talking about the resection mark this is a patient patient we saw a few months ago a large laterally spreading tumor in the rectum now in this sort of patient when you are resecting doing an est then you have to make sure that the margin is well covered so again this is a partial est done and you can see that margin is free of tumor nbi can help you in deciding that the margin has been adequately covered so in conclusion what i have discussed so far is that image enhanced endoscopy of which we have the eye spray the digital chroma endoscopy and the microscopy of which the digital chroma endoscopy is the one which is most commonly used currently it enables us to to assess the mucosal surface in great detail okay it is better than white light imaging in detecting lesions at an early stage and image enhancement like nbi has an established role in detecting dyspepsia its early gastric cancer as well as characterizing colonic polyps and obviously Clearly, with the artificial intelligence, it's likely to lead to wider application of this technology in clinical practice. So, thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, Amit, for a wonderful presentation, as expected, uh, making a difficult topic so easy. I hope the residents uh, uh, got some carry home messages. uh there are a few questions that you have covered both, uh, both the questions which are on the panel but uh, i would like to reiterate further you already mentioned that to do nbi or to do any image enhancement there are four steps the residents uh, please must remember it's just not a question of pressing the button so uh, he a bit specifically told just because you see a lesion you press the button and see that's not done that the first step is good cleaning of the whole surface second is to switch on the uh, another whatever technology you are using i will say here nbi third is to magnify that area and fourth is freeze that area and then you study that area am i right amit that's what you want yes, to convey okay. so i think these say, four yes. steps are very important now after we go beyond that amit i have a question for you out of all of the current available technology and enhanced imaging do you find there are any significant differences or just the cosmetic differences between the various things so so that's a very brief question so as i told you so obviously the lot of experience has been with pi because the technology has been there for a long time but if you look at the technology there So if you look at the actual technology, they are they are quite same. Whether it's a BLI or or it's this thing, they are all using a narrow wavelength of light. And whatever pictures are seen in articles in journals, the images look almost similar to NBS. So if you are familiar with one technology, you can easily use other technology without much of a, a difficulty because the pictures are almost similar. So should we give a message that you do not need to change 
sort of scope manufacturer you can only yes. have to at a scope whichever company are using which yeah. fits you the enhanced image technology you don't need to switch on only for this technology am i right so one point i would like to mention sir that earlier we had this uh, eye scan and pipe the previous one there they were just manipulating the image on a white light actually that was not as good now the bli of pedion and the eye scan oe the optical of the olympus of the pentax is similar to this the previous eye scan previous pipe was not as good as the current technology currently nbi bli and the eye scan oe are similar is what i would say so amit if i can if if amit if i can intervene at that moment uh, the yes. this earlier technique of fice and i scan were post processing isn't it they were yes. post processing yes. as compared to a uh, filter being used in the technology which we use now is that correct yes sir perfectly that's what i said so earlier they were manipulating the image after white light was obtained but now they all are using narrow wavelength of light so the image is obtained with narrow wavelength and that's why they are all comparable and images you see in the articles they look similar to like all of them look similar So, if you are familiar with one technology, I think you can apply any technology, whatever is available to you. Actually. Okay, uh, Amit, there are a few questions from the residents. Yes. yes. Uh, which classification to use characterizing colonic polyps, JNET versus NICE, and can we apply the same for the gastric polyps as? Well? that's a very good question sir basically now the nice the one of the problem with this it's a very simplified classification so in the nice two it also includes low grade dysplasia high grade dysplasia and superficial cancer it doesn't differentiate those two on nice two actually so to improve upon that the jnet was discovered but the problem with jnet has 2a and 2b and 2b is basically high grade dysplasia or superficial cancer and 2a is a low grade dysplasia but the problem is that when the japanese did the study the outcome was quite good but when it was applied in the real life clinical practice then actually in the real life situation the jnet 2a and 2b was not very easy. even recently gd or endoscopy journal an article was published recently in the evidence was that in real life it's not very easy to differentiate 2a from 2b but whether it's a 2a or 2b both of them can be subject to endoscopic therapy sir. so therefore i think it's all fit even if you don't use a genetic certification so um ajay seems to be busy with some calls so a few questions uh, amit we have only about 10 minutes and so we will like to you to answer as many as possible so yes, a lot of questions yes. that they are not able to differentiate as to when you describe the vessel and the surface can you yes, show sir. one of the images and uh, show them once again that what do you mean yes, by vessel yes. pattern and what do you mean by surface pattern there is some confusion it seems Uh, the white white line and the brown line you showed us yeah. very nicely, but I think for the students, if you can show I one mean, of the images and differentiate what is the surface pattern and what is the vessel pattern. Yes, I'll just share my slide again so that I can show that. Sir. Is the slide seen now, sir? Yes, yes. Just go to the. so this is the picture of stomach as i was showing now you can see this uh, brown structures the brown structures which are in a honeycomb pattern here these are the blood vessels okay. now in this picture in the antrum the brown structures are more like a coil so they are brown in color they are more like coils this is again the vessel the white structure right here which is running zigzag the white structure this white structure is the surface pattern in the antrum but in the body the white structure is more round in appearance okay Now I'll just show you colon to be clearer in the colon. So look at this picture here actually. Now if you look at the bottom second picture, the brown structures you see these are the blood vessels, okay? And the white structures which the brown things are surrounding, these are the surface parts. So the white structures are in an elongated shape. Some places they are brown, whereas the brown structures surrounding them are the Blood vessels. So obviously, as we more and more images, I think, more images, I think uh, you cannot be more clearer than what you have shown in these pictures. That uh, when you describe the surface pattern and the vascular pattern, they are entirely different. Uh, yeah. yeah. Different con constituents of the image. Now, so there is a question on the whether it can be used for cholangioscopy. So cholangioscopy. Now there are, I think, the obviously the spy which we doesn't have, but the Olympus one does have the NB. I think. But the problem with that is that first we need to know what is normal. 
So I think once we have to find out normal, then only we can apply. And there is not too much, but there is some literature that cholangioscopy it may be good. But because it's not used that widely right now, we don't have enough literature on that as a moment. But uh, I'm sure I think the more information, the more it should be, be used actually. So I think uh, if I can clarify further that it's only with a direct cholangioscopy you can use the NBI, which is from the Olympus company. Olympus, but exactly. with the spy glass, whichever okay. versions you have, you do not have that. Yes. Um, and uh, for the direct cholangioscopy, you require the duct to be dilated six to eight millimeters before you can do a direct cholangioscopy. Okay. So that's a limitation. There. The vascular pattern uh, or the, the, is what we see. That is the for cholangioscopy. What we use currently sir, for the spy, the vascular pattern, the leash of vessel nodularity, fibril. These are the ones we use for detecting malignancy. But you can also use PCLE for the for the bile duct for differentiating yes, yes. benign from malignancy. What about IPCL? People want to know a little bit more about the IPCL. You did show some pictures yes. towards the later part in this squamous cell carcinoma. But can yeah. you describe yeah. a little bit about IPCL? Let me again see, sir, if I can. That sharing screen is my screen still visible? I think, okay, one second. I'll just share yes. it. Yes. Yeah, now we can see it. Okay. So again, because of lack of time, I purposely didn't cover that area, but uh, just to be, yeah, just to show you. So this is the esophagus actually, which we see. Normally in esophagus, so this is the pattern you see on screen. It's the normal IPCL is the intrapapillary capillary loop. So normally these are the capillary, they are the more of a loop shape, and they are scattered around actually. Okay. Now this is a lesion where you have a cancer, and the pattern is distinctly abnormal in this particular area actually. So this is what the IPCL pattern is about. And esophagus, one good thing is that it's a stratified squamous epithelium. You don't have any pits or villi. So you only focus on the IPCL pattern, actually. And IPCL pattern is what helps you identify the cancer. So these are like these are loops of which are seen in the esophagus. Let me see if I have any other image of that. I can show you. So I think for this one, I don't have any pictures for the IPCL apart from that one. But I think it's very easy. If you look at anything, it will show just a coil shaped of vessels, which is seen normally in each of the So is it the size of the vessel also which is important or is the shape only which is important, Amit? So actually, the shape is basically the caliber of the thing. So give me one minute, I can just upload from a previous, so I have a minute, I can just upload from a previous presentation and I can show as well. Okay, while you are doing that, uh, there is a question about um, uh, if you do a water immersion, if you do uh, put water in the lumen, does the yes, magnification yes. or the images uh, become more clear? So water image, I think if you ask me, is like a double-edged thing. I mean, sometimes it makes things, like in Dodenum, it makes it better to appreciate. But in stomach, and also, I have not found it very useful, actually. So it depends on which area you are using. In Dodenum, it helps you with the villi start floating and you can see things much better actually. But in other areas, practically, it's not used the uh, immersion. And I think it should not, because it's basically you have to maintain the distance between the image and the lens actually. So it shouldn't make too much of a difference, is what I personally feel. So, do you use a, a cap while you're doing the procedure? Yeah. So, again, do that's you a use very important, very good question, sir. I think for the narrowband imaging for the upper GI tract, like esophagus and stomach, I always use a cap because caps gives us a very stable image. But in colon, sometimes you may get away without using it. But if you have a cap, it's very helpful to use it because it gives you a very good image of that stable image of the area. Ajay is back. So, Ajay? Yes. See, uh, Amit, there's a, uh, one question here. Yes, Can you yes. please explain about linked color imaging? So, linked color imaging... So also is a part of the Fujinon this thing, and that just looks at only one aspect, which is the color of the image actually, sir, LCI. And basically, depending on the color, you can say that this area has got cancerous skin, this area does not have cancerous skin. It doesn't look into details of color pattern, it just looks at the color, and it comes integrated with the Fujinon uh, system actually, so not with the other system. And, and it, uh, some, I, I did read some literature on the uh, use of uh, red color imaging for varicell eradication. Uh, yes, is there any yes. role there? So again, sir, I think for varicell eradication right now, I think what we do looks quite good enough. No? So we are able to see varicell eradicated. The thing with NBI, it doesn't penetrate too much into the depth of mucosa. These vessels, 
and coastal plains are actually and FBI images are not too they don't penetrate very deep actually so therefore whether it can i think our, our conventional way of assessing the eradication is quite good is what i feel nbi may not really help us in talking about the deeper vessels if they have been eradicated because the penetration is only superficial the blue ones don't penetrate very deep into the coast so i can share the thing with the ipcl pattern can i show now yes yes okay so if you so can you all see this picture yes So this is basically the IPCL pattern which we are talking about. IPCL stands for intra-papillary capillary loop. Now, in normal pattern, this is how the IPCL pattern is. Actually. But what happens is when there is a disease, they become thicker. There is a change in the caliber. The caliber it becomes thicker. Second thing is the morphology also changes. They may be like a petal of flower. They may be like multiple petals of flower. Then they can be branched. Finally, they have no particular shape actually. So, depending on the thickness of the vessel, depending on the morphology, we have different IPCL types. The type five, which is five one, five five three. As you go down the track, the lesion becomes more and more deeper. So something which is a five three and is not amenable to endoscopic therapy. Something which is five one and is amenable to endoscopic therapy. But I think for us, for practical purpose, say outside of Japan. Even if you can pick up a type five pattern, whether it's five one or two, it doesn't matter because at least it's not. You know, interestingly, now we are picking up these cancers in our center, and we are doing ESD for those patients basically. So definitely, IPCL pattern is something which is helpful. This is an example of the real-time IPCL pattern on a esophagus, and this is an example of an abnormal type of. You can see the things have become thicker, more like petals of flower. This is an example of superficial cancer. So there was a question on learning curve and the time taken during the procedure. So how much is, extra time do you usually take? So this again is a very important question, sir. So in terms of learning curve, obviously this technology, since you are seeing a lot of details and you are looking at different areas, and it varies from area to area. So if you are talking about say duodenum, it's quite easy to understand atrophy. You may pick up after a few cases actually. Some are a bit more time because some are more voluminous structure, the larger surface to cover. Barrets may be again a bit easier. So depends on which area we are looking at. And the thing is, what I personally tell people is that when you're doing image-enhanced endoscopy, whatever images you have obtained, you store the images. You whatever biopsy you have taken. After the biopsy report is available, you go back to the biopsy report, look at the biopsy report, what the biopsy finally came as, and then you can look back at the images again. So a lot of self-learning can also happen in this sort of a technology. And if you keep doing it, then with you will get familiar with technology. Easier in parrots, easier in duodenum, slightly more challenging in the stomach. Esophagus also is quite okay. Colon again, I think depends. Colon, if you are differentiating type two and three, it's easy. But hypoplastic is now a little bit problem because of the serrated adenoma, so we don't know. I mean, it cannot differentiate between those two type of polyps. So I think repeated examination, storing images, going back at it may help us in improving the learning. Ajay, we need to wind up. Um, so, final comments by Ajay. Well, uh, I think it's been a wonderful uh, experience to listen to and uh, uh, clarify the complex subjects in a simplified manner, and to actually apply that what is clinically relevant, not clinically relevant. And uh, these are carry home messages which he has said that NGI. I mean, these are all different technology. Or if it's similar to each other, depends on what you are trying to use to one of these that you are using. So you need to spend extra time, and we don't apply this blindly. You have to give, examine the area, and select the areas where you need to do. He has already clarified the uh, importance in picking up cancer, parrot uh, uh, malignancy in parrots. Testic cancer and the classification of polyps, the limited use in IVD surveillance, that is optimal. I think uh, there are expanding indications of NV. Microscopic people have been using that certain uh, ways in the spring surgery, or there could be some other uh, expanding modification. The enhanced imaging is there to stay, and we all need to know about it. Uh, I think that's a summit, uh, and uh, thanks of course, Mahesh and uh, uh, NB board to uh, facilitate this. Thank you very much. Amit, you have any final comment, Amit? Thank you. This is a good topic to introduce to the PGs because you know these technologies are early to start. 
understanding and appreciating this is good. So it's a good topic that we have discussed today. 